right, sounds good. Uh, this is the third meeting of the Cannabis uh, Sustainability Subcommittee. Um, present, we have uh, Kyle um, from the uh, Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Kyle, is there anyone else in, oh, and, and Nelly as well. Is there anyone else from the... Yeah, we have four members of the public in the room. I also have four members of the public. And then as part of the um, Sustainability Subcommittee Advisory Committee, um, we have Stephanie Smith, Billy Coster, Jacob Pollitzer, um, Tim Alasco, and Megan Howe. Is that how you say your name, Megan? Yeah. Yep, um, correct. Thank you. Present. So then I will call the meeting to order at 12.05 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I guess first order of business is to approve the meeting minutes uh, from the last two meetings. So now that we have a quorum, um, you guys both received the meeting minutes uh, via email from, yeah. wasn't the 13th, but from the very first meeting. Um, so I uh, wanted to motion to approve. Um, does anyone have any questions, concerns, discussion items, comments on the meeting minutes for the first meeting? Okay. I'll move to approve it, Jacob. All right. So Tom has moved to approve. Um, so it's all in favor of approving meeting minutes um, from our first meeting on September. Frame my calendar real quick. Nine. 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 Thank you, guys. Uh, say aye. 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 Billy, you good? Yeah, I said I. I said I. Sorry. No worries. Uh, meeting minutes are approved for September 9th. Um, next, we'll uh, motion to approve the meeting minutes uh, for last, or sorry, Monday's meeting, the 13th. Um, I guess the only ones who can vote would be me and Billy. And I guess if Kyle is not a voting member, then. It would just be the two of us since we're the only two present. So, Billy, think, do you I have any? Stephanie, I think Stephanie can still, move, or can still second to approve. I, well, I will abstain, ultimately. Okay. Um, but I'm going to, uh, there's one typo <laughs> that I found um, on, uh, I don't have a page number. Um, hold on, second page. It just says Act 150 as opposed to Act 250. Easy thing. Um, but I can second the motion, I guess, but I'm going to abstain from voting. Perfect. Billy, did you have any comments if yeah, you had a chance um, to? The only catch I have is there's reference to the Active 50 NRB General Counsel. Uh, I think it says Greg Noble with an N, but his last name is Bobol, B-O-U-B-O-L. So just a typo. Okay, perfect. Um, so I would uh, motion to approve uh, September 13th meeting minutes with uh, amendments on correcting the typo on the second page from Act 150 to Act 250 and changing the name to Bobol, B-O-U-B-O-L. Um, you want me to second that motion? I'll second it. All right, uh, all in favor of approving the meeting minutes with those two amendments, say aye. 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 All right, and Stephanie is abstaining. Uh, so the meeting minutes are approved. All right, thank you guys. Jacob, quickly, quickly before you you continue, um, Kim Watson, the other the other member of this subcommittee. I think there was some some confusion, and she's having time constraints. She's a a grandparent and traveling, doing lab auditing and stuff. And I don't think she's going to be able to be an active participant on this subcommittee. So the board is going to speak with some other advisory committee members and find another. A member for this subcommittee. Um, that way, we don't hit, uh, you know, issues with only having two members in quorum and, and stuff like that. In case uh, Billy or Stephanie has double booked or, or else, you know, elsewise <laughs> for not being able to be here at any of our meetings. So um, hopefully by Monday we'll have somebody else slotted into that position. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you for that. And then I guess while we're on 
the topic of meeting minutes. Um, I'm not unavailable on Monday, and I also sort of want to talk while we have you know Billy and Stephanie on here, um, and wondering how you guys feel about changing the schedule of the meetings rather than doing it Monday and Thursday every week, potentially doing Monday, Thursday, and then a Wednesday, and then Monday, Thursday. That'll give me more time to kind of compile um, more primer material, and I think have us just have better discussions and just be cognizant of everyone's time and have more kind of quality meetings. So I wanted to see if you guys were open to changing the meetings um, the week of September 20th to September 22nd and changing the meeting to October 6th. Let me pull up what that week was. That works for me. Okay. Would you look at the same time? You also have to make sure that um, the board and Nelly are, are available at those, those times too. Right. You, um, Jacob, can you send that in uh, writing so that I can make sure that the board is available? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. I should be. I should be. Um, On the 6th, I have a webinar um, that I have to participate in. Okay. Noon, noon to 1. Noon to 1. Yeah, yep. Perfect. Okay, I will send this in. Um, I guess after this, an email to everyone. Um, but I just want to kind of get initial impressions on how people were feeling about changing for like two weeks to a, to a Wednesday. Um, I think because as we're digging into topics, it might be it'd probably be best if we had some more time to to do that. So sounds good. Um, and then so for this meeting, kind of over this is gonna be the last of kind of our overview meetings, um, and then we're really gonna get into the nitty gritty of things starting next week. Well, um, sometime on Wednesday uh, with a review of uh, real quick um, of the energy require uh, recommendations from the Department of Public Service, um, and so let's just bringing up the agenda real quick. Make sure I'm not forgetting anything. And. Um, Um, and so, yeah, oh, also, um, Kyle, do you want to talk real quick before we get into it on the conversation we had um, earlier today about Act 250? Yeah, I mean, we don't need to get into into the weeds because Act 250 um, can be a jumping off point to larger conversations. Jacob and I did talk with Ari Rockland Miller. He's the Act 250 coordinator from the Agency of Agriculture. He gave us some good resources. We can put those resources up online um, and forward them to Billy and Stephanie. Um, you know, we talked a lot about a recent Vermont Supreme Court case that looks at the one acre jurisdictional trigger. And um, if you're under one acre in um, a jurisdiction that uses the one acre jurisdictional trigger, even if you're on a tract of land over an acre, if you're cultivating on one acre or less, you, you in your commercial product or in a commercial industry, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily trigger Act 250, which I think. Um, That's not going to stand. Uh, the legislature is going to fix that. That that was like a technical interpretation of Act 250, and I, well, that's it's, not it's, been it's, the way Act. It, well, it's going to change this legislative session. I put money on, so just I wouldn't bank on that provision. That's all I'm saying. Well, the Supreme Court ruled out on it as of today, so, you know, uh, yeah, we'll yeah, see what no, happens I'm in very the future. Aware of, I'm very aware of the ruling. All I'm trying to say is that the way that development is defined in Act 250 is slightly different from one-acre town and 10-acre towns, and I can't imagine that the legislature won't act next year to correct that technical difference and put jurisdiction back the way it was. So that may not happen, but I would imagine that will be the intent of the General Assembly come January. All right, we'll see. As I said, mentioning 250 is a slippery slope to more conversations. Um, we just had that conversation and, and reviewed that, you know, reviewed that case at a 30,000 foot level. I guess, you know, what happens in practice over the course of the next year, we'll, we'll see. So, but, you know, I, I, I understand I, Billy's perspective. I, and I was just going to say that the requirements in Act 164 relative to state land, state local, federal land use or you know whatever the language says um, in section five it, it and the the specific section that says that farming is I believe it applies to this as well that that 
cannabis cultivation is not considered farming. I want to say that's in session law. It's not like they didn't open up Act 250 and say cannabis shall be regulated. So there's potentially some wiggle room to finesse some incentives for some types of outdoor cultivation without opening up Act 250 um, and doing it via session law. Uh, you know, what those words are, how it moves, when it moves, you know, like that's all an unknown. Um, but I just wanted to kind of throw that on the table. Yeah, I think, there's, I think. There's potentially flexibility here. I mean, depending on what we want it, what, the Cannabis Control Board wants to do and what is the appetite of the legislature. Um, anyway. I think the appetite of the we don't need to get into this conversation. I think the appetite of the legislature when it comes to 250 is always, um, it ranges from session to session, but you know, it's 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 a lot. I think, I think the board is just doing outreach to different partners in different agencies with that 250 expertise to get an understanding of, of certain issues that we might be facing. And, and one of the things that I want to get more of an understanding on, whether it's through ANR and, and Greg and others, is whether or not uh, cannabis cultivation would constitute an improvement under Act 250. The word improvement in that definition can be interpreted as fairly broad. And, and so we're zoning in, I think, on parts of 250 that are going to help lead to other understandings of how this is going to fit into Act 250 jurisdiction. So. Without going too much further down the Act 250 rabbit hole, I think we made some progress this morning in understanding things. Again, I, I understand Billy's reservations with relying too much on, on an interpretation through the Vermont Supreme Court because the legislature will have their own priorities come January, but you know, it, it, still, it, it still means something as of today. So. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and Kyle, just so I understand, as of today from that decision, it's under an acre, it, it's not triggering. So, yeah, Tom, I can tell you some progress on it because I know we're gonna we're gonna take up a lot of time in trying to explain yeah. things. So, in, in Vermont, you know, depending on if a municipality has zoning or not, they're a ten acre town or a one acre town. Um, some ten acre towns abide by the one acre jurisdiction rule, but in those jurisdictions, no matter what the size of your tract of land is, if you're if you're um, the, the, the ruling says, and I'm going to get confused because it's confusing. <laughs> if you're if you're in a commercial, if you're making an improvement on an acre or less of land on that track in a one-acre jurisdictional town, you would not trigger Act 250. That's what I'm the holding of that that case says. Yeah, traditionally jurisdiction was tied to parcel size in those towns. This is now tying jurisdiction to the footprint of the development. And if it's less than a, an acre footprint, it doesn't trigger, even if it's on a larger parcel. So, so in pra practical terms, I think it's interesting for if you know if somebody's in one of those towns under that jurisdiction, uh, the square foot of an acre is what forty-four thousand square feet. You know, depending on your cultivation size, it, it could it could help a lot of cannabis growers up to a point not hit Act 250 jurisdiction. Um, I would just say to close out this argument or close out this discussion is um, my takeaway was from it was that um, with the exemptions of regular ag being from Act 250, there hasn't doesn't seem to be um, a massive concern from the state as far as environmental impacts. They feel that it um, seems as though the required agricultural practices compliance is adequate to kind of mitigate or quantify or you know deal with the environmental impacts of, of cultivation and that is written into act 164 so i think basing things off of that um is a good starting point for us um and stephanie we had talked about that at our last meeting there's definitely a lot of um outstanding questions i have that i think you would be suited to answer and so we'll go through that i think after, like in future meetings um, okay all right because i have some information yeah oh. yeah I guess okay. one real quick, I mean, this meeting I feel is a little, we've got, you know, some some time, but is there is a requirement in there, especially with the nutrient management uh, program, I think like Form 590, that kind of defers to UVM's guidance on different crops. My understanding is that they don't have any guidance on cannabis or hemp. And so I was wondering um, what your perspective is on that and how kind of hemp farmers are dealing with that requirement. Yeah, so um, the five, 
so on a I actually don't know where the, the jurisdiction for the required agricultural practices is. If it's a small farm, I just don't rem remember. It's not my program, so it, I am aware of it, but um, I don't have all the details in my mind right now. Um, but I do believe, while we don't have standards for hemp, what I do believe is there are standards for vegetable cultivation. So if a farm of a specific size triggers the need for 590, I think they have guidance for um, horticultural plants, vegetables specifically. Hemp's not considered horticultural at this point in time. Though. Um, so I think there is a standard. Um, and we have had conversations about making something specific for hemp, but I don't believe it exists as of yet. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, sounds good. I'm working with a few of the growers and nutrient um, suppliers and stuff that I work with to kind of get an MPK standard that potentially we can use for, for recommendations um, as, as a guidance. Um, my understanding, if I remember correctly, that the certified small farmer is like 50 acres. Yeah. Yeah. Basing it off of what I've seen in the, the HEMP report, I believe you were advising on um, uh, or, or helped write um, within the HEMP, most farms are like five acres. Um, with and actually, few. even since that um, report was done, I think that was from 2019, the majority of our growers are actually now under a half an acre. I mean, we had significantly less cultivation in 2021 compared to 2019. So, um, so it's unlikely that they're going to trigger that standard. <laughs> Gotcha. Or at least yep. in the health program. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I think it's going to be a policy question we might need to tackle later on is the way 164 is written and like the requirements of farms abiding by that. Then does it, do all farms need to abide by that regardless of size? Yeah. Um, so I have had, I mean, so the people we want on that phone call um, are Ryan Patch and or Laura DePietro, who can really dig in on the RAPs. Um, I have had a conversation. They are in the water quality division of the agency of the uh, agency of agriculture, um, and they they are of the position, you know, based on the fact that cannabis isn't considered farming, that they actually would not be the entity. The agency would not be the entity that would currently, as written that would apply sections six, eight, and 12 of the RAPs because it's not considered farming. Therefore, we don't have jurisdiction. Um, okay. The agency doesn't have jurisdiction. Um, so the question then comes, well, who's applying that jurisdiction? And is it, or is it just a self-certification from a grower or is it, um, or does a change need to happen? And, and if that change is made, you know, our agency is not interested in looking at thousand square foot grows because um, these standards wouldn't trigger on a thousand square feet. It's unlikely that manure is going to be spread. I mean, it's possible that there could be, you know, overland flow of manure from a thousand square foot grow that gets into a water source, but um, it's probably unlikely. <laughs> so there's that question of scale um, where the agency would be interested maybe in um, dipping their toe in and applying those standards um, if there was a change that something was considered, that cannabis cultivation was considered farming so that they could take jurisdiction. Um, or if that, if the crop is, um, um, grow is a part of a diversified farm operation that might include animals in which case the, the scale of that farm on its on its whole size would be of something that the agency would be interested in regulating because it's cannabis isn't the only crop so it's gotcha. I mean, just some like really broadly like just some ideas um so so piggybacking off of that, this is something we're gonna have to figure out um, as well with the applications um, and what's gonna be required. If there is, I guess, um, unknown jurisdiction on these things, do you think that requiring kind of farm plans based off of RAPs in the application process would be useful so that before anyone's licensed, they at least have assessed these things and are at least ideally living up to best practices or in compliance with it, regardless of if there's a agency overseeing it? I mean, that's possible is that there is a, you know, that is a part of the, the application that some basic standards that, that are explicitly outlined, you know, that are appropriate as well, um, get incorporated into the application process. And then, um, then they're, that individual, that applicant is certifying that they, that they're going to apply these practices. Uh, and then it's possible that inspectors um, could be educated, even if it's not water quality, um, to confirm that those growers, those cultivators are in compliance with whatever they said they would do. 
Um, so that seems a fair uh, idea. Okay, perfect. Um, and then going back to the agenda, so I have in here like a resource library. So I've got a big folder on my computer of kind of all of the most updated best practices guides, um, law reports on the different energy, water, like everything environmental, cannabis stuff, um, peer reviewed articles, etc. So I wanted to create a resource library that we can all have access to. So I'm working with Nelly to figure out the best way um, to do that. So that is in process to create a folder. So everything is there for all of our uses and then as I start to develop more agendas and guides etc um, I'll be referencing those articles um, and, and different areas like page number whatever or pulling out um, just to kind of help guide us with you know the updated uh, opinions facts everything from like kind of the industry so that's where that's coming from um, I was hoping for that before this meeting but it's it's in process um, and if that for some reason doesn't work out, then I will create kind of a reference sheet with all the links. Um, I just realized how much longer that was gonna take me. Uh, um, but uh, so that's in the works. And then, yeah, so in our very first meeting, we uh, talked about um, wanting to do kind of a cannabis cultivation manufacturing process overview. So I pulled from some of the um, presentations I've given in the past to kind of just go through real quick so we're all on the same page. I'll screen share real quick. Um, looks like Billy is having some issues with connectivity, but I'm not going to go through this whole... Uh, I'm good. I can hear you. I can hear you fine. Oh, perfect. Awesome. So I believe now I'm presenting so you can see my screen. So I'm just going to run through this very kind of quickly, um, but uh, kind of talk about sustainable cultivation in cannabis as we see it these days. Um, most of this I've done back from the, probably the last one I did was in 2019, 2020, so some little things have changed, but um, you know, this I thought was a, a oh, I can't do that, there we go. Pull it back so you can see full screen size. Um, was from a new article by Evan Mills that just came out in 2021, kind of going through all of the different um, direct and indirect drivers of energy using greenhouse gases. Um, you know, the big thing I think we could talk about, I don't know if it's necessary, but it's like the embodied energy and where we're setting those limit, like those, you know, fences or limitations on how we're assessing energy use. Mainly it's, you know, specifically on the cultivation um, and cultivating aspects. Um, but then, yeah, bringing in all of the inputs that you need for any kind of uh, cultivation. Um, and then the, I would say cultivation methodology, so I'll go through briefly indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, passive, and climate controlled. Um, I think what I don't really go too much into depth on the processing, but um, there's definitely energy usages for the extraction machines, um, which I would say is there's the um, hydraulic heat style to make um, rosin and resin um, aspects where you're putting uh, mostly fresh frozen flour, so um, the energy use of actually freezing cannabis, um, and then uh, the machines, uh, like hydraulic presses, um, or using uh, hydrocarbon extraction, so butane or propane, and then um, ethanol extraction as well. And there's also cold water hash, which is pretty um, low tech, um, but then also the baking, the um, vap evaporation or vacuum ovens, um, and then the packaging of that. And then waste is like, I would say, any other industry with the caveat that extraction is going to generate more hazardous waste, depending on the extraction method that I'll need to get. Um, uh, we'll discuss that during the waste section. So pretty much from an energy use, the main cultivation factors is the lights, the humidity, and the temperature, and how all of those interchange, um, or sorry, inter intersect. Um, and this little diagram I made a little while ago, um, but kind of showing how all the different equipment um, that is being used, different types of equipment, how they intersect um, and uh, utilize um, energy. And so it's yeah, mainly the lighting, the HVAC, humidification, um, automation, um, the fans for, for air circulation, the irrigation systems of pumps, um, mixing tanks, etc., and then CO2 supplementation for indoor and then sealed greenhouses. Um, this is more from a grower consideration, um, but definitely I would say cost 
the reliability of the equipment, the consistency, ease of use are the main factors. Um, so cannabis life cycle. Um, so this is if you're growing from seed. I wouldn't necessarily pay, pay attention to the days on the bottom, um, but it's either seed or clone. So you can take cuttings of cannabis plants. So most um, cultivation facilities will have mothers that they have year round, take cuttings off of that and turn them into clones, which is kind of what you're seeing here um, using aerators, which I'll go into in a little bit, and then kind of the final product. So here is the propagation. Um, so one thing I think we'd say to pay attention to, because um, we're going to need to talk about this in next week's uh, meeting when we talk about lighting standards, is you know most lighting standards I feel, especially when you're talking about equipment, if you're using it on like a PPE, um, so photosynthetic photon efficiency, um, so the how a light fixture converts watts to uh, usable light are usually based off of what's going on in flowering and, and vegetation. But I think propagation deserves its own carve out because most people are using kind of T5s fluorescent lights um, that don't qualify. And I think it's a financial burden to require gross to use LEDs um, for every phase. But this is kind of what you'll see in a lot of grows, regardless, even outdoor and greenhouse grows, this would just be in an outdoor um, like greenhouse to start. But this is usually um, how propagation um, occurs in the cannabis space. And I guess one thing to note is also is like the density of these is really high. So you get a lot more, you need a lot less square footage for propagation than you do for vegetative and flowering. Then you go into the vegetative stage, um, so this is, uh, so cannabis is a photoperiod plant, which means it'll stay in the vegetative stage until sunlight or artificial light goes less than 12 hours a day. So most girls I would say are using 18 hours of light for this phase, um, could also use 24 hours of light, though there is on some level a lot of diminishing returns with that. Um, and the planting density is a lot higher for the vegetative um, phase. Um, and then you have the flowering stage. Um, so as soon as the lighting goes less than 12 hours, the plant will trigger to start flowering. And then it's usually anywhere from like a seven to nine week cycle um, to get mature uh, cannabis. And here's some more kind of dense uh, cannabis cultivation examples. So this would be indoor. Um, you know, really packing them in just for efficiency's sake. Uh, a lot of growers now are using rolling benches for indoor cultivation. Uh, it's just kind of low-tech greenhouse, um, and then, you know, kind of an outdoor regenerative style. And then this is how you can tell when cannabis is ready for harvest is you have the trichomes, um, so the little bulbs is what's actually containing the cannabinoids, and when they start to mature, uh, they go from clear to cloudy to amber, and you want kind of a mix. Um, amber is like starting to degrade already, um, but usually a sign of a little bit of amber shows that the rest of the um, trichomes have been developed. Um, then you have the harvesting process. So most places hang up plants um, full on stalks. Some also bucket down and dry them in trays, just kind of grower preference. Um, then you do curing. Um, this is what's been going on for, I would say, thousands of years, um, mainly for preservation, but also to increase potency, preserve the terpenes, and then also to create a you know, pleasant smoke. You want to break down the, the chlorophyll in there, um, which does require um, kind of strict humidity and temperature controls. So there is um, energy usage with that. Um, there is three different types of cannabis strains, but mainly for cultivation purposes, there's the indica and the sativa. Because of how, where they evolved, they do have different um, phenotypic characterizations as well as flowering times. Um, yeah, this was like an estimate from a while ago on what the actual energy needs are, um, mainly because indicas are going to be shorter, broader leaves, um, denser canopy than sativas, which are usually longer um, and stock um, and airier. 
Uh, newer thing in the cannabis industry, um, and we're seeing a lot of this actually in Vermont, is autoflower. So there's a strain of cannabis, Ruderalis, which came from, I believe, the Asian steppes that is not photo period dependent and will just automatically flower based off of time. Um, this is really useful, especially in the Vermont climate, um, because you can get them into the fields earlier and they mature and you kind of get an earlier harvest. Um, but the plants, as you can tell, are shorter, kind of one main cola. Um, so the planting density will be higher, but we are seeing that to ensure that with the short growing um, period in Vermont, this is a one one way growers are coping with that. Um, you just go through this uh, really briefly, but just saying like between the three different phases, growers are using different types of lights, metal halides versus high pressure sodiums due to the light spectrum and what the plant needs kind of during that, uh, during the phase of either growth or flowering. Um, and then length and phase, this is really dependent. Flowering doesn't necessarily change as much, but this is where growers can kind of put their special sauce on their cultivation style and how big they want the plants. Indoor plants are usually gonna be smaller than outdoor plants because they are on a much shorter cycle um, and kind of in a perpetual harvest. Um, and then the equipment, um, so, you know, from an indoor, you've got everything from your lighting to a whole array of HVAC and dehumidification. Um, you do need to pay special, specific attention to heating and um, heating, cooling, and um, relative humidity in the rooms, as well as circulation. Um, the greenhouse using less equipment because it's getting its um, lighting from the sun. Outdoor doesn't really use any equipment at all, minus pumps for irrigation and weather sensors. Um, not going to go probably to too much of this. Uh, this is just a rough breakdown. This is going to be different for Vermont because of its growing climate, but it is really broken down into lighting and HVAC are the two biggest contributors. Okay, so this is probably 2008 energy benchmark. Um, I would not take this as um, you know, necessarily the Bible, but it's a good idea on the energy demands um, from a cultivation perspective. And I've started to model this out using a few different studies to kind of estimate what Vermont's energy demand is going to be based off of square footage as well as grams of production, um, as well as water usage. And so indoor is using a lot more energy. Um, you know, this is looking at, it's getting, you know, 0.8 grams per kilowatt hour used as opposed to like outdoor. Um, and then just the lighting intensity, so kilowatt hours, um, you know, per square footage is a lot higher. Um, so from an environmental perspective, we want to encourage grows to be outdoor or greenhouse mixed light. Um, so lighting considerations, um, you know, the industry is now, I feel like fully accepting LEDs and flowering. That was always the biggest barrier. Um, they just weren't that good when they first came out about five, six years ago. Uh, but now with more dedicated companies creating kind of specific lights or indoor ag lights, um, the LEDs are, I would say up to par these days. The biggest issue is just financial cost. They can be three to five times more expensive than double ended high pressure sodiums. And so it's definitely something to consider um, in the Vermont context um, when we're trying to you know, encourage a small farm local industry, um, what can people actually you know, afford and making sure that we're not creating environmental regulations that cause a barrier to entry financially um, since access to capital is definitely a lot different um, in the cannabis space than it is in other industries. Um, but the main things of growers can take under consideration is kind of the light distribution, the lighting intensity, and the uniformity of the light. Um, so HVAC, um, I would just say key comments is that the latent load is really important when looking at your HVAC rather than a, um, your sensible load. So most requirements, building requirements that look at HVAC is for humans and occupational idea where we care about temperature, the plants, um, what we have to pay attention to is the evapotranspiration rate and the humidity in there. So it does, um, essentially it's a different way of thinking about when you're sizing up HVAC for things, but there are a bunch of new technologies being used in the industry for efficiency. Um, and then, yeah, I would say these are kind of more of the cutting edge typical 
grows for indoor, how they look like a lot of people are going to using LEDs and stacking grows to capitalize on a lot smaller spaces and um, yeah, and then using these rolling benches so you can really um, maximize your, your planting density and, and use of lights. Um, and then greenhouses, so passive greenhouses, so we see a lot of this. Um, one thing from an environmental perspective is the cheaper, most used option are these plastic um, sheeting tarps that do degrade um, being exposed to UV light and can generate quite a lot of waste. So looking at that from a, a waste management perspective. Um, kind of the newer hit on the block, which we're seeing a lot of, which I believe we will see a lot of in Vermont, are these sealed climate controlled greenhouses because they can be used in winter ones. Um, and so essentially, I would say a lot of these are light cultivating indoors, but having a glass ceiling um, or a polycarbonate ceiling and you know capitalizing on um, the sun as their main energy source and then supplementing it with lights uh, to make sure that you're getting the uh, daily light hours that you need or daily light integral is what it's called in, cannabis, or in agriculture. Um, and so a lot less energy, not a lot less, but less energy than indoor, still using quite a bit of energy as uh, compared to outdoor cultivation. And here are just some examples um, of different facilities. Um, and then with a greenhouse, you're going to need to use a light deprivation. Um, and that's to just ensure that when you're in flowering, you're maintaining a less than 12 hour lighting cycle. Um, and then here's just from a grow that we um, put in some meters on. You can kind of see indoor is just straight, you know, lights are on the whole time, then turn off. Greenhouse is, you know, this is with the light sensor. So you're only using the lights when the sun's not providing it for you. So you are capitalizing on um, some energy efficiencies there. And then outdoor cultivation. And then just some models of like regenerative ag. This is what I think ideally we should try to get growers to do, or hopefully we will see the small 1,000 square foot cannabis growers incorporating more of these practices, which I think we should try to encourage, incentivize, because you do get a lot of environmental benefits from this style of cultivation. Um, you can kind of just polyculture, cover cropping, uh, green manuring, uh, beneficial insectaries, etc. Um, one thing is most cannabis growers are using efficient irrigation systems um, as well. And then, um, yeah, the other part of efficiency is how they're actually operating the facility, facility that they have through environmental set points. So vapor pressure effort is in. Root zone temperature, daily light integral, air movement. So just wanted to kind of run through that. Um, here's on this, this is a certification um, I created with the city and county of Boulder that's just incorporating strategic energy management, so ISO 5001 standards into cannabis. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can definitely take from what under industries have used um, and just incorporate it into the cultivation context. And then I left this slide in. I was kind of referring to it um, in our last meeting, but when looking at cannabis, cultivation facilities, you know, based off of how Vermont is creating the zoning regulations, but usually there's specifics on where cannabis cultivation can be, there is going to be a clustering effect. So that does have grid impacts or environmental impacts um, in different geographic regions, um, because you do most likely have to be away from schools, liquor stores, government buildings, etc. And there's only so many of those places um, available. So. Just wanted to run through that real quick. Um, one question I do have, and I don't know if we have the answer to it, but I was wondering what um, the state of Vermont with available resource, uh, sorry, available commercial buildings is right now. And are we going to be seeing cannabis cultivation processing facilities kind of moving into unused cultivation, or sorry, unused commercial buildings that are already available, or are we going to see kind of purpose-built buildings? Um, I don't know the answer to the question about available square footage in commercial buildings. I would venture that indoor cultivation may, I mean, it depends on what a town's doing, honestly, but um, it might be in an industrial area. I don't know, Billy, if you have any <laughs> thoughts on that or any um, 
rather than than in a commercial area. When I think of commercial, personally, I think of our downtowns. I don't see cultivation mm. happening in our downtowns. Yeah. But that I you know I say that, but I don't know for certain. Um, and then available square footage in industrial areas. I'm sure there's a industry group that has that information, but I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, but it could be new because you know a lot of people you reuse buildings that aren't appropriate for the use that you're going to use them for <laughs> and it's better to build new uh, uh in which case uh, you know just to return to act 250 um that might be an appropriate use of act 250 <laughs> uh for indoor you know cultivation um at scale but jake jacob just from the the market structure kind of analysis i think they're making an assumption of more of an 80 20 model um there's a lot of assumptions in that uh 80 20 indoor outdoor um and uh, i think most of that will be kind of small cultivators um so as far as your kind of indoor commercial or industrial space that those will probably be i'm guessing more more of the outliers but again based on assumptions um i, I think that's probably what you're looking at okay Jacob, just so time check, it's 12.45. I know we've probably got a couple of folks that want to provide comment um, in, in five minutes, five minute warning. Jeffrey, I don't know if when the public comment time comes, if you have a sense of your membership and who is looking at indoor buildings or starting from scratch, so on and so forth. But Happy to cover. Great, all right, five minute, five minute warning, but we have some members of the public who might be able to provide some anecdotal evidence or, or examples, so. Perfect, yeah, I would just like to get Billy's perspective um, on, on that. Yeah, I, I don't have a good sense of that either. I think it, it's gonna be driven largely by like the mark, like the intensity of and volume of use and how much space is needed. Um, I think there's probably a fair amount of available kind of commercial industrial space in Vermont. I know that there's at least one large growing operation near me that took residence in a lumber yard that closed. So I think that's often the Vermont way is that especially entrepreneurial startups kind of go into spaces, ret retrofit them for their purposes and, and go from there. But I, I just don't have a good sense of like the, the size and demand on, on those sorts of resources. So it's, it's hard for me to say. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, the reason I bring that up is um, we see in a lot of places, um, you know, when the, I guess there's a couple of different aspects, but one is how laws are written. A lot of the times um, when you're applying for a cannabis license, you have to be operational within a year uh, to prevent people from kind of hoarding licenses, et cetera. But that also kind of had uh, unintended consequences of forcing cultivators to buy older buildings or buy what was available and then start retrofitting so they didn't um, run the risk of uh, kind of construction overruns, et cetera, on putting their license at risk. But then that, because there was no requirements necessarily on building envelope, which we'll be talking about next week, um, you know, we should definitely think about it uh, to make sure that buildings are as efficient as possible from an envelope retrofit perspective. Um, so that's where I was going with that. Um, and then, yeah, uh, the last thing on here was really the estimated impacts. Um, so I've started to do some calculations um, on that. The only one I've really got finished at this point is looking at, I don't know, it's looking like the industry can use somewhere between 3.8 billion to 7 billion gallons of water when it starts off based off of the VS estimates. Um, and then as far as energy use, um, Password is here. Uh, 52 megawatts, megawatt hours, give or take. But um, I need to kind of go back through and do that. But I'm um, going to try to have those estimates for us, um, as well as um, different how different state agents, there's different state regulatory bodies have written their regulations and what's available from the com conversations we've had in the last two meetings um, for like energy, water, and waste. So we can kind of get into the nitty gritty on things. Um, could you just repeat that water consumption? Was that 3.8 to 7 billion gallons? Yeah. And that's annually? That's annually given a, and I will share this with everyone. I was just uh, kind of rushing to. Um, fine. I just wanted to make sure I heard your aid, so thank you. Yeah, I wanted to make sure it's three, three. No, I'm sorry, I'm misspeaking. It's 38 million gallons to 7 million gallons. It's, yeah. Um, I have a 
follow-up question. We're talking about regulation, and, and that's what I do. I'm a regulator. Um, but I'm wondering whether or not some of these environmental standards, instead of talking about them in terms of regulation, whether or not we can talk about them in terms of incentivizing, um, you know, getting people to voluntarily do things the right way. Um, and again, I'm a regulator, but that sometimes is a better tactic. Um, and, and providing some benefit to that individual that does something the right way rather than saying everybody's got to do it this way. Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess there's advantages to both, but I wasn't sure if you're um, aware of other um, uh, states that look at it in terms of in, in incentivizing good practices, um, but just, just something to think about. Um, I think um, a lot of states um, incentivize good environmental practices through their application process and they kind of do like a merit-based application. So the more kind of environmentally friendly you are, you kind of get these little brownie points um, on that. I am a firm believer really, like incentivizing is probably the way to go. And that's definitely, I reached out to Energy Vermont um, to bring a representative in our meetings because I think when it comes to energy efficiency, we want to have regulations that don't um, interact or don't essentially prevent the incentives and the rebates that are already in place. And so I think it's finding that balance of of looking at kind of the environmental impact. So like for indoor cultivation, I think we should have some kind of energy regulations at a base minimum, and then everything else should be incentivized. And so um, I think that's probably the best way of going about it. And I think we'll definitely gonna be a, a topic of conversation when we get into each specific um, aspect of that. You know, I think with the, um, the wraps, for water, I think most of it is kind of, I don't think there needs to necessarily be regulations on that because if they have to abide by these uh, required agricultural practices, they already are essentially um, practicing best management practices as it comes to- I, I just have to like, kind of reiterate as I consistently have that the wraps apply to agriculture. There may be different standards for the same activities and resource impacts for non-agricultural activities. So the RAPs may be the, the, be the best practices, but there may be a whole different suite of kind of expectations for things that aren't considered agriculture that are more um, restrictive. So I, I'm not saying that's the case, but I just, we have to be wary of using the RAPs as the baseline for everything, because it, it may in fact not be, right? So, okay. Yeah, I guess that is uh, something to discuss. I, we had talked last meeting, um, my understanding from the way 164 was written was saying that um, they would need to abide by sections 5, 8, 12, um, even though it was not considered an agricultural practice. So I guess we need to get some clarification on that. But yeah, we'll definitely discuss that um, in each section. I do want to now give it the floor to the public that's in the room. Before we do that, can I just ask for one more thing? I you, thank you, Jacob, for sending out the schedule of future meetings. Um, that's super helpful. At the beginning of this meeting, you talked about an alternate schedule of going like two, one, two every other week. So if possible, by like today or tomorrow, the latest, revising that schedule, because I need to bring certain experts to some of these forthcoming meetings on waste and water so that it can be a productive conversation. I need to get those folks booked. So the sooner I can know the dates of those meetings, uh, the better, so I can make sure we got people there. So thank you. Very, yeah, thank you. We'll work, we'll work on that, Billy. And just, just before we move to public comments, I know we're running out of time. So, so just so I'm of the right opinion so it says the week of september 20th which is what monday you're proposing to move that meeting to wednesday correct okay so that would be the 22nd and then no other meeting that week yeah correct okay i just want to get a good make sure nelly understands exactly what uh and if you could provide this to nelly an email that would be great and we can find a time on wednesday that does work for you stephanie and Billy, was it this coming Wednesday that didn't work, or was that the following it, Wednesday? It was this October sixth okay. that I have a conflict. Um, all right, we'll figure it. We'll figure so, it all yeah, out. I'll let you know what works. I'll, I'll send. I'll, I'll talk to Billy specifically, <laughs> and then I'll let you all know what we can accommodate. And I think but the the twentieth. I think the twentieth works for both of us. The twenty second. Yes. The twenty second. Yes. Oh yeah, twenty second. Whatever it is. Yeah. All right, and just just so. Billy and Stephanie, you have the correct documents for um, the 22nd meeting. Jacob has on here reviewing the Department of Public Services Energy Recs. Do you have a copy of those, Billy, or do you need us to send you one? I was gonna send out 
that to everyone okay. with additional information prior to the meeting. Yeah, it would be great just from a board perspective if, if you know, these recs are already written, how do they look to the subcommittee, how do they look to everybody, and getting to a, a point where we can start getting stuff out of the subcommittee for more board level um, understanding of how the subcommittee feels. So it feels like there could be made progress there depending on how Jacob, you interpret those energy recommendations and how they work for Stephanie and Billy. Yeah, that's why I chose it first. To yeah. gotta get us, uh, gotta win the get us uh, some deliverables. Fantastic. All right, I know we got probably got some public comments. Jeffrey, um, or any? Yeah. Feel free to come up here. If you wouldn't mind just saying your name for the record, that'd be great. Hello, my name is Bernardo Silva. I'm a policy director at the Vermont Birds Association. Um, I wanted to thank Jacob for his presentation. I thought it was very informative. Um, I just want to pick up on some concerns I have um, that kind of go beyond what was covered today. Um, the, the main issue is regarding processing, packaging, and waste. Um, if you know or are aware, uh, the Act 164 uh, dictates or you know regulates that oil concentrates can only be dispensed in cartridges. Um, those e-cigarette cartridges are not regulated in the United States as of yet. They're mostly produced in China, or I think they're all produced in China, uh, by Chinese producers who don't really factor in Americans' health. Um, you know, it's a mass-produced product, so there's a, already an underlying public health standpoint, but with regard to that being the only form or method of Vermonters being able to purchase product, you're talking about a huge waste problem. You're talking about throwing metal cartridges with lithium batteries into our um, dumps and leaching into our fields, water streams. And so, you know, this is a huge issue. With regard to the presentation and how um, this ties in, you know, there's a rare situation here where a lot of times environmental sustainability doesn't go hand in hand with what's sustainable for business. But coincidentally here, when looking at processing, the little different levels of processing that J Jacob brought up, you know, you have water-based processing, which is the simplest and I think creates the least amount of waste, right? You're not dealing with hazardous chemicals, you're just doing ice and water, so mainly your energy consumption or, or is in, uh, in refrigeration. That refrigeration is already used in hydrocarbon extraction and then moving along the line, CO2 extraction and then fractional distillation, right? So in the order that I stated, you're talking about not only um, what type of processes yield the most, obviously you get the most out of the least with solventless extraction than with hydrocarbon, then you get less with CO2, then you get less with fractional distillation because you're concentrating the product all the way down to a smaller compound within the original raw material. Um, in, in considering all this, you know, solventless extraction is the easiest one to enter for a small business. So aside from it being the most environmentally sustainable, it's the most sustainable from a business standpoint. So why am I bringing this all up? Because as written in Title 18 um, on Ver uh, the Vermont statutes, Chapter 84, Possession and Control of Regulated Drugs, Subchapter Number 1, Regulated Drugs, Section 430H, chemical extraction via butane or hexane prohibited. No person shall manufacture concentrated cannabis by chemical extraction or chemical synthesis using butane or hexane unless authorized as a dispensary pursuant to a registration issued by the Department of Public Safety pursuant to Chapter 86 of this title. Um, as some of you well know, there have been documented uh, risks with hydrocarbon extraction in the past but organizations have come out on the national level to serve as certification processes for not only the equipment, but the laboratory in which these products are being made. So, you know, going back to the scale, solventless, then hydrocarbon, then CO2, then large-scale fractional distillation. Basically, with cartridges, the, the existence of this regulation where oil can only go into cartridges, you're basically limiting the pro and, and hydrocarbon extraction being banned, you're limiting um, the, the creation of products to CO2 extraction and hydro, uh, 
fractional distillation, which are by far the most expensive to get into. With this regulation that CO2 is banned, the dispensaries are the only ones with their unlimited licenses, are the only ones that can produce these products. You can't make, and then and finally, in terms of solventless, which is the regarded as the most craft or the most sought after product, because it is the one that resembles the original plant the most in terms of smell, taste, etc. It's literally a concentration of what you have, not a chemical extraction. That essentially with a 60% THC ban is capped as banned, right? No one goes out and buy and a product, a solventless hash product that's below 60% THC is considered non-desirable compared to a product of higher THC. That's just how it is. So there's all this overlap going on. You know, we're gonna fill our dumps with metal cartridges. We're gonna have a public health crisis when this is the only way people can consume. You're affecting Vermont business owners who produce other methods of vaporizing that are more natural, such as Pyrex, you know hash oil rigs to you for the colloquial term. You know, all these things are overlapping and it's affecting Vermonters as consumers, as producers, and environmentally. So I just hope that this is taken into account uh, by the subcommittee because, you know, it is, it is a serious issue. I don't want our dumps filled with cartridges. You know, other regulation in Vermont against e-cigarettes has you know, been guided towards curbing the use of this. So why did we pass a law that makes it so that this is the only method of consuming? Um, I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Bernie. Jeffrey, I know we're running really Thank short, but if you yeah. have comments. Thank you. I need to run to another subcommittee as well, so I'll, I'll be super brief. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Jeffrey Pitts, hello. Vermont Growers Association and uh, Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Um, Thanks for your time. Um, just some numbers that we're looking at that we've seen, we poll the cannabis community across the state annually. Um, our analysis shows that we've got over uh, 500,000 square feet uh, in total canopy in production on an annual basis. And of that uh, half a million figure, we've got about a, approximately a 60-40 split. So 60%, over 60% grow outdoor. And keep in mind that's light depth outdoor, not greenhouse, not hoop house. That's once a year, maybe twice a year, pulling a harvest. So these are families that depend on this livelihood. Uh, meanwhile, uh, about 40% grow indoor or using mixed light uh, techniques. Uh, I do want to mention a couple concerns really quickly with regards to outdoor cultivation. We are seeking that gets redefined uh, legislatively uh, as farming. Um, those who want to grow outdoor right now, uh, they are not considered uh, an agricultural practice yet have to abide by the uh, state RAPs. We think that is fundamentally unfair and inequitable. Uh, further, uh, land right now is going up in Vermont. Commercial land is going up even faster. So uh, right there, full stop, uh, barrier to entry, if we're asking people to seek commercial land when we know how much land is used for farm purposes in the state. So things to think about. Um, I'm leaving a lot behind because I need to jump to another meeting. Uh, I'm heartened to hear a, a push to move towards regenerative practices. I think that falls in alignment with what we're seeking in terms of uh, redefining outdoor cultivation. We would look at, and what we're advocating for, just to uh, uh, front end some things for you guys, uh, uh, non-continuous canopy size. You cannot have regenerative farming uh, if you have a fixed block of 1,000 square feet on a piece of land. It's just not practical. Um, light depth should be considered not just uh, indoor but also outdoor as well because that's basically what we're doing. Um, one of the uh, central intents of 164 is to transition the illegal marketplace. We need to meet Vermonters where they're at now. We can't expect them to throw away everything and uh, fit into a small, tightly uh, defined box. I've got a lot more to say. I think this was a great discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I just ask you a couple follow-up questions for you? Um, with the figures you just asked with the 60-40 split and the figures you're polling, is that uh, medical, hemp, illicit, and then kind of what's your gauge on how many farms? That's a really great question. Um, uh, and I don't have the, the survey figures in front of me, so I don't want to misrepresent them, but I would respond by saying this, Jacob, and thank you for asking that question. Um, Right now, guys, in Vermont, we have uh, large market actors that are touting a 100,000 square foot uh, production facility. Keep that in mind when we're thinking about environmental standards uh, and really where we want this market to be. Um, we are seeking uh, statewide production caps. 
uh, indoor 10,000 square feet, mixed light 20,000, uh, outdoor 40,000, so a one to four uh, ratio. Uh, this is common in, in other more sort of progressive markets. Um, so uh, I can follow up, Jacob, with those numbers, but uh, that's how I would respond right now. All right, thank you so much, really appreciate it. Both of you guys um, taking the time out and, and letting us know um, these different things. Maggie, any, any comments? Okay. Nope. Okay. I think you can move to adjourn, Jacob. Okay. Yes. Uh, move to adjourn this meeting. Thank you guys all for your time. Um, I will be sending out the email to um, the subcommittee and board members to change the meetings for uh, next week uh, right after this. So thank you, everyone. Uh, join the meeting at um, 1.04 p.m. Eastern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.